right, let's look together, please, in 1 Kings chapter 22, and then we're going to move into 2 Kings this morning, considering the ministry of Elijah. Pray with me, would you please? And then we'll launch into this. Father, again, meet with us now. Stir us, lead us, feed us, direct us through your word and by your spirit. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take just a few moments here and review. It's so important, I think, because we're looking now at someone new that uh, Elijah will encounter. But it's so important to consider all the things that this man had been exposed to in his coming up years and what his interaction would have been vicariously with Elijah through his family. We were introduced to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 16. But uh, before we even came to really an understanding of who he is, we considered his times. He was living at a time in Israel, which was the portion of Israel, the northern kingdom, a divided kingdom. And he's living in the times when Ahab is king. Ahab is the one whom the Bible says did more to provoke the Lord than any other king before him. We said that he was the MVP or the greatest of all time at aggravating God as a king in Israel. He did something as if it were a light thing. He took to wife a woman by the name of Jezebel, who was the daughter of one of the enemies to the kingdom of Israel, a woman who was a worshiper of Baal, and not only a worshiper, but a strong advocate. And she brought in her influence into the northern portion of Israel, the northern kingdom, and she had a strong hold on Ahab. Elijah is a man who grew up in a mountain range. He's far more simple than Ahab. He is a man of prayer. He is a man who is bothered by the times that he's living in. And according to the book of James, he began to pray that God would show himself to the people of Israel. And God did that. God gave Elijah the commandment to go and tell Ahab that there was not going to be any dew or rain for the space of three years. We looked in the Bible and we saw how God had had a covenant relationship with Israel regarding rain. And he told them that he would provide them with rain when it was required for their crops, both in the early days and the latter days, that they would have what would be necessary for their crops to grow and for their land to be fertile and to have what was required to live. And so they knew by direct commandment of God that when there's a lack of rain in Israel, that's God withholding his blessing on them. And so for those years, we watch in Israel as they go through this tremendous drought, which leads to a famine. We watched as God cared for Elijah at a brook. He fed him every day with ravens. We watched as God moved him then from that brook into a neighboring town, actually to the hometown of Jezebel, where there was a widow there who was at the point of death. She thought that she had just enough for her last meal. God took Elijah into her household, and God provided for her and God provided for Elijah and her son through that difficult time. You'll remember the end of that adventure for Elijah was that that woman's son died and that God used Elijah and that the power of God for that child to be brought back to life by God through Elijah's prayer. Then Elijah went and showed himself to Ahab and that great contest on Mount Carmel ensued where Elijah and the false prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove would each build altars and it was literally that, a contest. Elijah the gentleman allowed them to go first because he knew there was no threat that their God would ever answer because their God is no God. They built an altar. They started in the morning. They got to praying and, and asking their God to, to take and accept that sacrifice, and he did not. It became lunchtime, and Elijah encouraged them to continue on and kind of pushed at him a little bit, and they kept going until he, eventually they began to cut themselves and they began to bleed and still... Nothing happened. And then it was Elijah's turn. Elijah said, get those 12 stones. Remember, for each tribe of Israel, a united kingdom. He got that offering and he laid it out. And then they had him go and get 12 barrels of water. And the Bible gives us even the description of the ditch that was around the altar. Those barrels of water were poured over the offering and lapped up there so much they just spilled out through those ditches there of water and then Elijah stood and he prayed and he asked God to show himself that day and God did God sent fire down God not only accepted the animal sacrifice God consumed the rocks God consumed the dust God took that water and dried it all up and the people cried out the Lord is the Lord God of Israel there is one God and that Proof that Elijah wanted in his ministry that God would show himself that took place. And then you'll remember that 
those prophets were taken and they were put to death as was necessary under the law for those that would introduce the worship of false gods. They were put to death. When Jezebel heard that news, uh, heard the news that her prophets had been put to death, she said to Elijah, I'm going to do the same to you and if it doesn't happen within 24 hours of now, then my gods will do to me what you have done to my prophets. Of course, again, an empty threat because her gods are no gods. And Elijah did something. He got scared and he went on the run. He went as far as he could to the jumping off point. And then he went a day's journey. And the Lord came to him and the Lord ministered to him. The Lord cared for him. And the Lord directed him and helped him and gave him strength for 40 more days. And that journey that he would take to Mount Sinai. And he would go into a cave and it was there that God would teach Elijah the lesson that even though Elijah didn't see it, God was working and he told him that there were other people just like Elijah who had not kissed Baal and had not bent their knee to Baal and that Elijah was not alone. And then he gave to Elijah renewed purpose. He said, you're going to leave here and you're going to anoint Elisha. You're going to anoint a couple of kings and these kings that will be anointed and Elisha will finish the task. They'll finish your ministry of ridding Israel of Baal. Then we watched last week as Ahab stepped out of line. He wanted something that belonged to Naboth, that honest, honorable man who had property that had been given to him by God through his fathers. And Ahab said, give that to me. Let me buy it or trade me. And he would not do it. And so Ahab went home whimpering and pouting and Jezebel said, I'll get it for you. And Jezebel hatched a conspiracy. And the elders and the people of that town where Naboth was from, they were a party to it. And they set him up, and they set him up in an occasion where all eyes were on him, and they accused him of blasphemy. And two sons of Belial, and we considered that term, and those people, they came in and they accused him, they lied. And they took Naboth, an honest, honorable man, they took him outside of town, and they stoned him, and they put him to death. And they had received word from Jezebel that that herb garden that you wanted is now yours. And Ahab stepped in that garden and he looked at what was his now. And that time the Lord said to Elijah, you go and tell Ahab I've got a message for him. And he told Ahab that in this very place, this very place where Naboth was put to death and the dogs came and licked his blood, when you die, the dogs will lick your blood in the same place. In 1 Kings chapter 22, we'll not do anything with it because Elijah is not in it per se, but it is the death of Ahab. Ahab joins up with the king of the south, a man by the name of Jehoshaphat, which was a bad decision on his part. And they're going to go to battle together against a common enemy of, of theirs. And Ahab on that day receives word from another prophet of God, who's only mentioned that one time in the scripture, that he was going to die in battle, that he was not going to return. And the response that those in Ahab's court had to that prophet because they didn't like what he said was to smack him in the mouth. Ahab said, lock him up. Lock him up and I'll deal with him when I get back. And that prophet said, you're not coming back. You're going to die. And Ahab going into battle with the king of the south, the king of Judah, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wear the garments of a regular soldier. You wear your royal garments. The enemy said to his soldiers, Here's who we're after. We're after the king of Israel. And it even happened that the king of the south, Jehoshaphat, the fellow who shut the, should not have gotten involved, they were going to kill him and he had to exclaim, hey, I'm not the guy you're looking for. Seemingly, Ahab would get by with this and would escape this day. But an archer took an arrow, shot it in the air. Ahab, who thought he could hide from God, Ahab, who thought he could do what he wanted and take what he wanted, found out that day that God directed that arrow right to him. And there he died, just as God had said that he would. His son will take his place. You'll remember the judgment that was passed on Ahab last week. We saw it. You'll remember that even God showed mercy on Ahab and said that he would not wipe out his household while Ahab was still living. God, true to his word, allows then Ahab's son to become king in the north. We read about him a moment ago in verse 51. Ahaziah, the Bible says about this man that he does three things. One, he walks in the ways of his father. Then the Bible mentions that he also walks in the way of his mother. 
And I'll hit this briefly and move, move past it. I looked fairly diligently to see if any other king who was ever expressed about them that he walked in the way of his mother. I see it over and over again that they walked in the ways of their father. They, they walked in the ways of their father's fathers. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But the only mention that I saw of any king, and that's a very common expression in the Bible, the only mention that I could find of any king where that says that he walked in the way of his father and then went on to say, and in the way of his mother, is this guy right here. The reason being is because of who Jezebel was. Jezebel's way was her way. Ahab's way, his way, but also Jezebel's way. She was strong-willed. She had a strong and a stranglehold on the palace. And that's why God didn't want Ahab to marry and to bring in to his kingdom somebody that would have that hold and would have that leadership in the lives of the people. Now, not to belabor the point, but there's something to be learned there. Fellas, set the tone in your home. Set the spiritual tone in your home. Be that spiritual leader. Be that leader that can be considered. Be that leader that can be followed. Ladies, it bears out in the scripture that you're to follow your husband and his leadership and his spiritual leadership. And the way of the home is not to be divided. It's to be the way of the Lord. Not Ahab's way and Jezebel's way, but the Lord's way. Not only did he walk in the way of the father, not only did he walk in the way of the mother, but the Bible says he also walked in the way of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was that first king of that northern kingdom when it was divided and he had built those worship centers. So basically what is being said here about this man is that he is all over the place. He's got Baal. He's got God to some involvement. Those that want God. He's got Jeroboam's false worship centers. Anything goes. Anything. Two years in is all he lived. The Bible then tells us of two things. And there's our message for the day. Chapter 1 and verse 1. He has two crises. Number one, he has a political crisis. He becomes king and when Moab hears that he's become king, evidently they see weakness in leadership and they seek to throw off the relationship that they had to Israel. Moab are the people who are the descendants of Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. Lot was the man whom God had to grab and drag out of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was Lot whose wife turned around, and the Lord Jesus said about her, remember Lot's wife. It was Lot's wife that turned around and looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Lot would go with two daughters, and they would go into a cave. This is given to us in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 through 38. Drunkenness would ensue, and then an inappropriate relationship with two daughters would take place. And from Lot would spring forth two nations, two nations that would be a continual problem for the people of God, Moab being the first. In 2 Kings chapter 3, it talks about the tribute that they were paying, 100,000 lambskins and 100,000 goatskins every year. And it was a custom in that area when somebody was the power or when somebody held the strong hand which had been the case for Israel with all that Solomon and David had done that people paid tribute to them in other words you're near us we'll leave you alone and we'll protect you but it's going to cost you if you're known for agriculture then you'll bring in your crops to us and you'll pay us a percentage if you're known for caring for animal, animals being herdsmen then you'll bring that to us Moab saw a moment there where they could push that tribute off and say, no more. That's a political crisis. That's an occupational crisis. People have problems. There, there's friction in the world. There's times in our work where we have crisis. There are times when plants close. There are times when industries change. There are things that once were successful that at times become unsuccessful. There are ventures that we get into. There are jobs at times that we so enjoy that oftentimes we receive bad news that, hey, that job is gone or you're no longer needed. We have crisis in life. Everybody in this world experienced crisis. I spoke this week with two men. A fellow called me to do some business and help in, in something else, and I heard in his voice that his, his accent was different. I said, where are you from? And he said, I'm... I'm from the U Ukraine. And I said, where are you now? He said, well, I'm actually in Ukraine. And I said, you're in Ukraine? He had, works on the phone. 
with shipping and things and transporting things in America, here in America from Ukraine. I said, are you in a place that's safe? And we tried to, I tried to have a conversation with him. Then the person that he was negotiating and helping with the shipping process came, and I spoke to him, and he was from Russia. Now, how long have you been in America? I've been in America a few years. When did you get out? I got out a few years ago before the war started. And I said, how do you like America? He said, I like America. He said, Russia's got problems. And I said, yeah. I said, America's got problems. And he said, yes, they do. But he said, different problems. Different problems. But everybody's got problems. Everybody has crisis. Not only does he have this going on with Moab, but then the Bible tells us in verse 2, and it's an interesting, an interesting verse because how often in the Scripture do you hear of somebody having an accident or something, them falling and they're becoming a problem from it or a complication, but that's what happens to this king. Verse 2, And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice. That word is lattice. Help him find a seat in the back, Brother Justin. Get him a chair in there and help him sit down. A lattice, uh, when I was a kid I thought that was lettuce. But it's not, it's lattice, all right? He fell through this lattice. Now, what's the purpose of the lattice? Then a rich home, there would be a first story and then perhaps a second story. And that second story would be surrounded by something that would hold a person in. Evidently, this king is leaning over or looking out. I don't know exactly what it was, but he fell through. I don't, maybe he was in shock. Maybe he was having a good time. I don't know, but the Bible tells us this. And he's in a bad spot. So he's had a crisis in his occupation. He's had a political crisis going on. Now he's got a personal crisis, a health crisis. How many of you have ever had an accident? Something that was unexpected physically. You didn't anticipate it happening and it sidelines you for a while. Maybe you pulled a muscle in your back or you broke a bone or something just out of nowhere. That's a crisis. This fella is not ready for crisis. He does not know where to go. I'll bring this to a point here in a moment. He's concerned, am I going to live? I need answers. Sometimes in life, people who know the Lord and know the way of the Lord drift. They find their boat going a little different direction than it ought to. They encounter a storm in life. And they're quick to return back to where they know they can get answers. And I'm always glad when they do. I'm always thankful, friend, when someone who has strayed or erred encounters a crisis, whether it be an outside crisis, whether it be a personal crisis, that they come to the one who has answers, the Lord Jesus. That they come to the Word of God. Don't be smug. Don't climb up on your high horse. Don't have that attitude. They're only back because they've got problems. The Lord uses problems to help return his people. The Lord used problems in the life of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, man, he was down and out and he had made a mess of things. And what did he say? I'm going to go home to my father's house. Because in my father's house, even the servants get better treatment than what I'm getting. And what was the attitude of his brother? And the parable is as much about the oldest brother as it is the prodigal. His attitude was not receptive or gracious, was it? And the father corrected him for that. This guy doesn't know where to go. He's got a crisis. He's got a problem. I've watched funerals turn lives around. I've seen weddings that turned lives around where young people would come and see others as they're going forward in their life and in their devotion to the Lord and folks who have not, young people who have not, who've maybe made different decisions, see that and say, well, I want to get my life squared away. I've watched at funerals where people have made commitments that I'm, I'm going to live my life differently based on what's become the end of my friend. We've watched as people have had a health crisis. we watched as there's a king by the name of Hezekiah, a good man, who has a health crisis, and he cries out and he prays, and the Lord spares him and gives him more years. God uses anything and everything and anybody if we'll let him. This man, this king of Israel, Israel with its history and its heritage of being the people of God, this man whose name means Jehovah holds. Jehovah holds. Consider the ultimate insult. He's concerned about what's going to become of him. He's looking for answers. He's looking for help. He calls his messengers. 
Notice verse 2. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Ekron is one of the chief cities of the Philistines. This is about 40 miles outside of Samaria. Beelzebub, referenced here only in this passage in the scripture and then spelled differently in the New Testament when the Lord Jesus would use that name. Baal, being that false god who is the supreme male god in the religion of the Canaanites. Baal, and then Zebub added to that, is translated the Lord of the Flies. And there's a lot of thoughts about that. Why, I don't know. I just know this. He was going to the wrong place. Going to the wrong place. He sent his messengers. He said, you go down. We believe that there was a temple there in Ekron where he would go to the temple of that false god and he would find out from Beelzebub, am I going to make it? Is there a hope for me? Let me say this about truth. When people ignore, neglect, and turn from truth, they are not prepared for crisis. You've got to have truth in the midst of the storm. You've got to have something sure to hold on to in the midst of conflict, in the midst of crisis. Young people, what your parents are seeking to equip you with in truth and knowledge and understanding is that which will help you to weather life storms. It's that which you can run to, maybe in times of failure, maybe in times of defeat, maybe in times of setbacks, but it is there and it is truth. And I'm thankful today that we have truth. I'm thankful today that we have the Word of God because we all find ourselves at times in the midst of crisis. Here's the king, the king of Israel, looking for answers in the temple of a false god. Verse 3, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is not Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Elijah steps in the path of these messengers who are going to get an answer for their king. They're of Israel. Their king is of Israel. And he says, and let me paraphrase it if you'll allow me to. Hey, guys, do you have to run down to the Philistines to find out what's going on, to get answers? Is there not a God? In Israel? Where's our God? Why would you go there? Hey, you go back and tell the king. Look at the verbiage that's used, would you please? Go back. Verse 4. Now therefore thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not, what? Come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. Elijah said, you go back and tell the king, he is not coming down. He'll die on that bed. And that's what God says. They return back, and I've got to hasten. The king is taken back, that they're back so quickly. And they said, hey, we ran into this guy, and this guy that we encountered, he asked us, is there not a God in Israel? And he said, hey, that you need to know that you're not going to come down off of that bed. And he said, what did he look like? Who is he? Who is this that would speak such a way to me? And they said, well, when we're looking at a description of him, look with me, would you please? Verse 5, and when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, What are you now turned back? This is the king. And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel, but that thou sendest to inquire? Look at verse 7. And he said unto them, The king to the messengers, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? What did he look like? Describe him to me. And they answered him, he was a hairy man. You see that? A hairy man, right? And girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the what? The Tishbite. Oh, had he heard of Elijah before? No doubt. Consider all the interaction that Elijah had had with his father. One, drought and famine. Two, contest on Mount Carmel. Three, declaration of Naboth's vineyard, you're going to die. And now this declaration comes to him through this statement. Hey, what are you going down to the Philistines for? Isn't there a God in Israel? You go back and tell the king he's not coming down. So what do you think his response was? He sends 
a group of soldiers. Fifty of them. Look what the Bible says. Verse 9. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to meet him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. That's Elijah. And he spake unto him, this is the captain here of these 50 men. Thou man of God, the king hath said what? Now every word in the Bible is there on purpose. Come down. Hold on a second. Go back to verse 4. What had Elijah told the king? Thou shalt not what? Come down. Do you suppose that the king sent that captain with those 50 men for good relations with Elijah? So here's Elijah, get the picture. He's sitting on top of this stony hill here. He's in a safe position. They've got to come up to get him, and he's sitting there. This captain comes up, and he said, Hey, the king says to you, man of God, come down. And Elijah says, and look, now this is important, because what takes place here is really staggering when you read it. Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If... I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Well, evidently there's, there's more going on here than just reading right past it, right? If, if I'm the man of God. You see, Elijah represented to Israel and to those kings. He represented the word of God. He represented the voice of God. Hebrews tells us in chapter 1 and verse 1 that God, who at sundry times and divers manner, spake to the fathers of old through what? Through prophets. Elijah was the word of God. Elijah was the authority of God. And see, this king had no use for God. This king had no use for the authority of God. How do I know this? Because when his crisis came, where did he go for answers? Who did he run to? When he was laid up on that bed, when he had fallen through that lattice and he laid there with a head injury or whatever it may have been, did he one time say, hey, God, heal me. God, help me. God, direct me. God, forgive me. No. Did he say, hey, living God, and did he say, hey, messengers, go and get Elijah and bring him to me, this prophet that we have? No, he said, go down to the Philistines, to their God, and get answers. You will not get the answers that you need from anyone or any source outside of this book right here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and is the direction towards understanding is God's word. What's our country going to do when we hit crisis time? Who will we run to? What source of authority will we run to? Where will we get our answers? So now this king sends this captain and his 50 men to come. They're going to take Elijah and they're going to arrest him. They're going to bring him back and possibly put him to death like Jezebel had put prophets to death before. And Elijah's sitting up on the rock and he said, listen, if, hey guys, You've come to me in the spirit that your king sent me. You don't believe anymore in God or the word of God or the truth of God and neither does your king. And so if I'm the man of God, as you've called me, then let fire come down and consume you. And right there in that moment, fire fell and 50 men lost their life. Read on. Look at verse 11. Again, also, he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down, how? Quickly. In other words, you better get down. Hey, the king has sent us again. And hey, O man of God, sitting up there on the hill, you better come down. And the king says, Come down, and you better get a move on. You better come quickly. And how well did that go over? And Elijah answered and said unto them, verse 12, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. 
100 plus men now burnt to crispy critters at the base of this hill because of some king who ought to know better, who won't come to God, who won't turn to God. This, this is uh, uh, applicable. 2 Timothy chapter 3, speaking of the last days, it says that there will be people who have a form of godliness but are denying the power thereof. They stand in our halls of Congress and they open in prayer. I wonder sometimes the percentage of them who actually really believe it's going anywhere. I'm not taking away from those who are actually legitimately people of faith and who believe in God. But as a formality, prayer in our country and the name of God in our country is thrown around. We've placed it on our images and I'm thankful for that heritage, but let's just be honest about it. Do we really in God we trust? Do we really care about the God, of the God, the living, true God and the, His Word and the authority of His Word? Do we really govern ourselves? Are we really patterning ourselves after His Word? And God says to these messengers who've come from the king, and now the king who was told you will not come down, now comes to Elijah and says, come down. No. Come down quickly. No. But here's what will come down. Fire. Because God, just as he had done in Mount Carmel, wanted the people there to recognize who he is. The fire of Carmel that came down was the fire of mercy, truth, evidencing God. The fire of truth that comes down here is the fire of judgment. God had shown himself to Israel. God had shown himself to Ahab and Ahab's household. God had established his testimony with them and they still rejected him. They still refused him. They still turned from his authority and now God brings the fire of judgment upon them. Notice the third captain. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, and what? Try again. And he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50, verse 13. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burn up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. Notice verse 15. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, what? Go down. The king said, come down. Come down quickly. I'm not moving until the Lord tells me to go down. Who does Elijah answer to? Who does Elijah serve? Who does Elijah recognize? He recognizes the true and living God. Who does this third captain, what does he finally understand? I got a knucklehead for a king. And I am not bringing the message that that fool is sent. I am not telling you, oh man of God, in a condescending tone what you're going to do. I come to you on my knees recognizing God, recognizing who you are, and I plead with you, I plead with you, spare our lives. Notice what is never said by the third messenger. Come down. I'm not asking you to come down because the last guys asked you to come down and fire came down. I'm just throwing myself at your feet. I'm throwing myself at your mercy. Would you please spare us? What is that? That's humility. What is that? That is the response that the king should have had when he fell through the lattice. That's, his, that's what he should have responded to the Lord. He should have fallen on his knees and said, Lord, have mercy on me. Notice this with me, would you please? We must hasten. Verse 16, Elijah would go down. And the Bible says, and be not afraid of him. Evidently, he understood, Elijah understood that his purpose in coming for him originally was something that should have brought fear to him or concern for his life. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with them unto the king, and he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, 
For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no God in Israel to inquire of the word? Therefore, because of that, look what God's telling this king here. Elijah's gone down to this king and he says, listen, let me tell you something. God's got a message for you. Because you didn't recognize that there's a God in Israel, because you don't see his authority and his power, because you did not consult him, but rather because you sent your messengers down to go and find out from a false god what was going to become of you. Therefore, because of that, because of your response in crisis, because of who you sought out, therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt what? Surely die. Do you know let me tell you something about God? He's merciful. This man saw God's mercy in Ahab's life. When Ahab and Jezebel committed that tremendous atrocity and had Naboth put to death and judgment was passed on Ahab, the Bible says that Ahab humbled himself and God gave him a space. God allowed him to live longer, if you will, or not see things in his lifetime regarding his family. God gave him that. Do you not think that if this man here, Ahaziah, if he had not turned to the Lord as he fallen through that lattice, if he had not allowed that political crisis of that enemy coming against him, that personal crisis of being hurt and having that accident, if he had turned to God in all of that and humbled himself as the scripture expresses to us in James 4 and in 1 Peter chapter 5, when we humble ourselves before God, he will exalt us, he will lift us up. God is good that way. And he wouldn't. He wouldn't. Now I must go back to this. He walked in the ways of his father and his mother. He was not prepared for crisis. And I believe that a part of that was because of how he was brought up. Don't mistake it. God gave him plenty of revelation throughout his parents' life. And he's without excuse. But let's face it. When Ahab is your daddy and Jezebel is your mama... There's probably some complications in your thinking. The book of Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 1 and verses 8 through 9 that we are not to forsake or to turn from the instruction of our father or the law of thy mother. It says that there'll be an ornament of grace to our head and chains about our neck. There'll be good things, position, power, blessing. On the other side of that, though, is what if you got Ahab, Jezebel directing you? What do you get? What chains do you have? May I ask this in closing? What chains are we forging that we are placing around the necks of our children and our generation? What crown? We're passing no royalty down. We're not, we're, we're, generally speaking, we're not passing down a, a crown of high calling and high purpose. We're putting dunce caps on people. We're being chains of enslavement. Change to sin, foolishness. When this man, when crisis hit, it revealed who he is. And there are times in our lives when crisis hits, where do we go? Some folks, when crisis hits, they turn to the bottle, they turn to the pills, they turn to another relationship. Where should we turn? We should turn to the, to the Lord. Young people, turn to God. You find yourself at the end of things. Remember this. There's a merciful, long-suffering God who brings us to the breaking point at times so that we can look to Him and turn to Him. I'm always happy when people return to truth. Always happy for that. But did He? No. And the prophet said, if you had, things would have been differently. But because you sought out this God, because you went for answers there, there is no answer coming. It's just a sentence. I would ask this morning, and well, not for fear of embarrassment, but if I were to ask this morning, how many of you have come to a crisis and you've come to the end of something, and you turned to God, and God restored or God brought back, God strengthened a situation that you never thought could possibly be corrected, and God corrected it. That's a God thing. That's a God thing. That's why when you're in crisis mode, run to Him. Run to God. Run to His Word. 
Run to his authority. Recognize it. Don't be proud. Humble yourself. Recognize who you are. Recognize your, your, your dealings in the matter and come to God. If you're here this morning you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I wish today and hope today that you would let somebody share the gospel with you, the best news you could ever hear about salvation. I would suggest to all of us that we make a commitment now that when crisis comes, we make a beeline to God, to the Word of God, and we listen to Him. We receive instruction. We receive correction. We receive the encouragement that's needed to go forward the right way. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the Word of God, the opportunity to preach to your people. Lord, as we consider the testimony of this king and his family and your prophet Elijah, so many things to be seen. But we take from this just a general, just general learning and understanding that when crisis comes, where do we go? Our heart is revealed in the midst of crisis. Who we trust, who we're looking to, who we follow. Unfortunately, this king in the midst of crisis went looking for answers and direction in the wrong places. Lord, help us. Help our hearts to be tender to you. Lord, help us to be training and teaching our young people about you and seeing them established and developed in that. Lord, that they might pursue you. If you're here this morning, say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved. If I were to die today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. I don't know that. I don't have that hope, that confidence that you spoke of and salvation. And I'd sure like to know that. And, but I have concerns about whether or not I'm saved. And you'd say, Pastor, please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that today? Say, Preacher, please raise, pray for me. I see your hand. Who else this morning would say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. If you're here this morning, say, Preacher, I get exactly what you're talking about. I get this, this thing of crisis and God and depending on God and trusting God and coming to God. And you'd say, Preacher, there was something in that for me today. Something in that for me today. Preacher, please pray with me as the Lord works in my heart. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that today? Several hands this morning. Perhaps this morning you find yourself in the midst of crisis. A place of difficulty. A place of affliction. I want to encourage you this morning. Why don't you run to the altar today? Why don't you bring that situation to the Lord? Maybe you don't know which way to go with it. Maybe you don't see the end or how it could ever possibly be corrected or helped. Perhaps even you've listened to the enemy so long when he says to you that God doesn't care about you. But I would remind you of that wonderful promise, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. I'm glad we have a God who cares. I'm glad we have a God who works with us. I'm glad he's that father that we hear in that story, that he's faithful, that he's consistent, that he's true. And I hope today you'll run to him. Maybe your marriage is in crisis today. Maybe your relationship with a young person is in crisis. Maybe your health. Why, well, I think we oftentimes run to anything and everything but God. Where we ought to start with is God and then go from there.